All right, hi everyone, hi Shabir. Um, this is our fourth and final webinar for uh, Gender and Power Thematic. Hold on. <laughs> um, just some housekeeping, the same as every webinar, so please put yourself on mute when you are not speaking, but we really, really encourage you to jump in whenever you want. Um, you can select the gallery view and you can put your videos on if you so wish. Um, also, you can use the chat function to ask any questions either to the group or privately. And um, just another note that this call is being recorded, but we really encourage you to contribute um, throughout. Amazing. So today's agenda. So we're just going to go through an introduction, then we're going to talk through um, a process. So do it yourself process for applying a gender lens to any of your work and activities. So in the last three webinars, we've gone and looked at how you can apply a gender lens to your organization, to your program and to how you interact with your ecosystem. And so this is kind of the process that we've used to come up with the strategies that we took you through in the last three webinars. So we're, go th we're going to go through this first and then we're going to walk through two examples, which are Y gap examples. And um, the first one's going to be to do with our program and the second one with our organization and more specifically gender diversity in our leadership team. And then we're going to give you a really exciting update about the gender lens incubation and acceleration toolkit we've been mentioning throughout our course, which contains a lot of the content we've gone through and then we'll close. So it is a little bit content heavy in terms of this last webinar, but again, really happy for you to jump in and we can definitely adapt this content and just go through one example if that works better for you. So again, feel free to jump in at any point and let us know how you would like this to be structured. And I see that Shankalita is, is joining us as well. It's really great. So just in terms of an introduction for today. Hi, Shankalita. Okay, gone on mute. <laughs> um, so for today, the focus is going to be in going through practical examples of how to develop and implement strategies to address gender and power related issues. And we're going to use examples of that. Oh, Shankalita, I'm just going to put you on mute because there's a bit of background noise. Um, and then um, the objective, like um, most week and in applying a gender lens is really to increase the access and inclusivity of your work for all genders or specific gender, depending on what your gender objectives are. And the outcomes for today that we want to get to is to have um, two really practical examples of how you can implement strategies to achieve your gender objective. And this is kind of everything we've talked about so far in all of our webinars, but this is a way to illustrate it with what we've been able to do. Um, again, we're still learning in this whole journey. So this is just examples and we're kind of done a couple of strategies and are still learning and, and growing, but we want to share these with you um, so they can be helpful. So in terms of a do-it-yourself do process, um, we just have come up with four practical steps for going all the way from identifying gender and power related issues within your work to implementing strategies to address these. And the four steps are to first define what your gender objective is, then looking at how you can identify issues around gender and power within whatever part of your work that um, you want to address, then how to develop strategies from there, and then how to implement them. So we're going to go through each of those steps in a little bit more detail. For the first one, so defining your gender objective, and um, we've started all of our calls talking about this. So ideally you just set your overall gender objective that you have for all of your work. So an example could be to increase gender equality in all of your operations. And the idea with having an overarching gender objective is that all of your team and your work can be focused towards achieving your specific gender related objective and goals and it helps to just be more effective and efficient and being able to measure as well that you're reaching the goals that you want to reach. Um, then you can actually define different gender objectives for specific parts and the three that we explored through this webinar were your organization, your program and your ecosystem. And when you're looking at defining gender objectives for those, we talked about 
a few different ways you can do that. You can um, decide to establish a quota. So this can be a clear metric around um, achieving part of the objective. For example, having 50% women entrepreneurs in each cohort. It can be a mandate, so not a specific quantifiable metric, but essentially a principle of how you're going to operate. And this can be, for example, ensuring that the, each founding team has a woman in it. And then um, it can also be a consideration. So it's not something that you particularly measure, but it's something that you will try to do through your activities. So we will consider how gender, um, the gender of the founder in our decisions. And then it can be that you have no gender objective for a specific part of your work, whether it's your organization, program, or ecosystem. Um, and just so you know, um, I'm not going to go through too many examples at this point because we're going to go in depth into two examples of how YGAP has been able to go through this whole process from A to Z. So we're just going to go through the process first and then we'll go through, we'll walk through it with two examples. But feel free to jump in at any point if you have any questions. The second step then is to try to identify issues around gender and power within your work. So you want to ask yourself where power and gender imbalances exist and consider questions around privilege and bias, decision-making power, control over resources, how opportunities are currently being distributed, what are the um, status, rights and entitlements um, within your work. And then once you've identified certain issues that you want to deal with, then you want to do further research into making sure that the issue you've identified is actually an issue and that you really understand the cause of that issue. So you can do that, for example, um, by actually going and talking to the audience that is concerned in that issue through a focus group, you can gather information through a survey, or you can consult existing research on the topic as well. Then the third step is to create strategies. So you want to develop strategies to address the problems that you have validated. And um, there's a few ways to do this. It could be just ideating as a team. You can get inspiration from what others are doing in the field. And that's where the toolkit, which we'll mention at the end, is really helpful, as well as our examples, if they can be inspiration for you in solving some of the problems that you're facing. Um, getting inspired, um, inspired by other fields as well. Um, sometimes the best innovation comes from other parts of the world and we just kind of apply it to our situation and getting advice from gender experts as well and the Criterion Institute, who I think most of you would have come across in your work at some point, dedicate all of their research and time and effort into studying gender in the context of investment. And so for example, if that was one of the, the, um, the problems you were facing, then there would be a great expert to reach out to to get guidance on how to solve a particular problem that you're facing. When you're developing strategies, you really want to take into account how difficult a strategy will be to implement as well. Um, depending on where you are in your program cycle, where you are in terms of raising funds for your own organization, um, you want to consider the time that will be required to implement a strategy as well as the resources that will be needed, whether that's funding or human resources. And then once you've decided on a few strategies or just one strategy that you want to try, we really recommend then testing that strategy in a very lean way before going into full implementation. So um, a few ways that could be useful of doing that we found is to reframe your strategy as a hypothesis. For example, um, if we're thinking of mark a program marketing, the hypothesis could be that um, having all your marketing with female role models will lead to X amount more uh, attractiveness of the program to female founders. So this allows you to then treat it as a bit of an experiment and devise some lean um, ways to be able to see whether the strategy actually does help to address the problem. It also helps you to see if there are any unintended consequences. Uh, with any strategies relating to gender, and, and we know that this is a very complex space and it, it touches a lot of like systemic issues and systemic um, factors doing one thing can actually have some unintended consequences on other parts. So it's really good to test these strategies and see whether there's any unintended consequences to what you're trying to implement. Once you've done this and you've selected the strategy that seems to address the problem the best, we go into implementation. So 
a few tips around implementation. Um, again, having very clear gender objectives, ensuring that all of the team understand exactly what you're trying to achieve and are all aligned. Um, having milestones and measurable indicators. So I think we all know this from just doing impact measurement in our own work. It's very important to be able to measure whether whatever strategy you're implementing is actually having the impact, the outputs and outcomes that you want it to have and being able to measure that over time as well. Um, since we gender related and power related issues tend to evolve and change in different contexts, it's really important to be able to track whether the strategy that you're trying to implement or that you are implementing or have implemented is still working down the track. So if you have very um, clear measurable indicators, that's a way that you can track that. Um, having strong support from leadership and board. I think we know this from all of our activities. That's very, very important for them to be involved. But I, as you do the analysis, the gender analysis, you'll, you'll realize that really that they're the key decision makers a lot of the time. So it's really important for them to uh, be backing you in implementing the strategies. Then having adequate resourcing, money, time, people to carrying out the implementation plan. And we're gonna go through this again as we go through our examples, but applying a gender lens will take time, effort, and money a lot of the time. And there's ways to do it so that you can start applying it with whatever resources you have available, but it will um, make, it will, at some point, it will, you will we'll need to make sure that there's adequate resourcing there to be able to implement um, whatever strategies you're trying to implement. And then accountability by all concerns. So ensuring that all stakeholders that are involved um, feel like they have ownership over um, the strategies that are being implemented. So this was our DIY process. Um, I'm just gonna pause here if anyone has specific questions. Next, what we're gonna do is dive into some specific examples of how YGAP has applied this process in applying a gender lens to our work. But before then, is there any questions from anyone? Amazing. Okay, so we're going to dive into examples. There'll be many, many more opportunities for you to let us know if you have any questions. Thanks, Audrey. So that was, um, and you know, we, we pasted out and we're going to take you through some real practical examples because this is everything we've been working on in the past um, several weeks and this is actually bringing it all together. Um, just please do be aware that while we are going to take you through a whole example, um, I'll also maybe give you the time frames of how we've actually done this because while we're going to cover it in a few minutes, um, it's, it's actually been something we've been developing over several months and in some case a few years. So um, really hardcore examples um, to hopefully inspire you and I'm not going to say these have been easy and some of these are work in progress so that's something to remember as well. So the first one is how YGAP developed our Why Her program. So um, the Why Her program is our female focused accelerator program that we run across three different regions at the moment and we created it to create an equal platform for um, female entrepreneurs because we were, uh, we'll go into this, but we, we were seeing that um, with all the work that we were doing, we've supported 450 entrepreneurs to date, but we were still finding that female entrepreneurs weren't, be ta weren't taken seriously as their male counterparts. They couldn't access the same support as their male counterparts. They were almost coming to us with less expertise, um, less networks. And not only that, they, they couldn't get into the programs because they just weren't at that same stage. And then ultimately they couldn't access funding to scale their ventures. Um, and a lot more as we were working with our, with our female entrepreneurs. Um, so th this is what we were seeing happening. So it is, and here I also want to talk about the interchanging of um, identifying the issues and the gender objective, right? Because sometimes you won't be able to come up with a gender objective straight away. What you will see is are all the issues that are really annoying you in the work that you're doing. So what we were seeing was really frustrating our team. You know, why weren't we getting female applicants? Why aren't women in the ecosystem um, accessing funding? And sometimes, so 
it might not be that clear to go, okay, this is our gender objective. It might be really clear. Um, but in this case, we actually came up with our gender objective after we were looking at the problem. So ideally, you'll have your gender objective for your organization. If not, don't worry, because I honestly feel you can interchange that. Um, so if you look at the steps that we're going to, the first step is defining our gender objective. So we wanted to increase access and inclusivity of our program to female entrepreneurs in the regions that we worked with. Um, and so the second step was looking at what are the issues that we are seeing, right? And there are a lot of issues we were seeing, but the main one we were seeing is in our accelerator programs, especially in Bangladesh, we were not getting female applicants. And for example, in Bangladesh, about two years ago, uh, in our cohort, we only had three out of the 15 who were female entrepreneurs who actually came into the program. And so we stepped back and we went, why is this? And um, we asked all the questions which we're gonna come to. We wanted to highlight really quickly as well that there are broader ecosystem issues that we identified. Uh, we won't go through this in detail. All of you would have heard me talk about this in Singapore and Audrey and I speak about this in the last few weeks. Um, a lot, it, it's good to have these in your mind and good to see what is playing on your mind in your, within your organization, but then always bring it down to what is the problem you are solving. And so for us, it was the lack of female applicants. That's the issue that we were trying to solve. And then we looked at um, the various aspects that influence why we were facing these issues. You know, why weren't we getting female applicants? And <coughs> <coughs> what you see here are five things. And I can tell you there's a lot more, but these were probably the five most prominent ones. And we're going to talk about the first two. Um, so we looked at how we were marketing our program and how our program was advertised. And we've worked with some of you on this, saying, you know, what, what, what are the pictures we are using to advertise it? What are the channels that we're using to advertise it? Are female entrepreneurs actually looking at those channels? Um, is a language we're using conducive to attracting women or were they gender charged? You know, we were using, we do talk about pitch nights or we used to talk about pitch events and, um, you know, winning funding. And we looked at how we were actually marketing our program and we changed that a lot. And if you come onto our website and look at how we talk about why her, it's actually very, very different to what we used to. Um, and then we also looked at the ecosystem. So when we looked in Bangladesh, and in Africa and the Pacific, but we'll focus on Bangladesh for this example. We looked at what, what kind of support actually exists in the ecosystem that we're working in. And do all our entrepreneurs, male and female, have equal access to this support? And as we started looking at this, the answer was always no. And that's why not only weren't we getting enough applicants, the applicants we were getting were not quite ready to come into our program. Um, and then we looked at also our pipeline and our application process and selection process. If you want to know a little bit more about this, we do cover this in quite a lot of detail in, a, in, in the, not the previous webinar, but the one before. So do go into that, but that this gives you a snapshot of what we did look at. So then we knew, okay, what our gender objective was um, and what are the issues that we are facing and a few things that we wanted to look at. So that's when we started looking at, okay, how are we actually going to change our strategy to get to attract more female applicants? So the first thing we did didn't work. And uh, we want to talk to you about that because um, it's very likely that the first few things you do test might not work for a number of reasons. So in Bangladesh, we work with our partner organization, Build Bangladesh, um, who are based there. Um, anyone, all of you who are actually in Bangladesh would know this. They're very well connected. They've been in the space. They understand the social entrepreneurship space and everyone knows them. So they're our trusted partner. They said, you know, maybe one of the reasons is that female applicants, um, often they still live with their families and the families don't trust us, you know, as running the program. Who is YGAP, you know, and who are these facilitators that come in? Why is it five days? So why don't we invite them um, a week before to come and meet us all? And so then we created, um, we actually did a whole family session where you could bring your parents, you could bring your partner, your children, and they got to meet 
the team. They got to meet the facilitators, the YGAP team, the Build Bangladesh team. That was lovely. But then even then, before the accelerator actually started, the females still dropped off, right? So sure, we attracted a few more, but they still didn't go into the program. So we're like, this still isn't working. That was an easy option in the sense that it, sure, we put a little bit of money into running that session, a little bit of coordination, a little bit of thought around it, but it still didn't get us the quality of applicants that we know we can get from the Bangladeshi ecosystem. So then we said, okay, well, why don't we create a female focused program run by women for women? And as you can see, even optically here, the amount of thought and work that got, went into the second option is significant. So this was over a year's work of planning and knowing that we had already run a WIHER across Africa, a pilot, um, and now we're doing a country focused one in Bangladesh. So here is when we then looked really deeply at our marketing and the strategy behind our marketing. How are we actually going to attract these women? How will they know that this program is different to the other ones? We changed the language, we changed our branding, we changed the colors and the look and feel. We were very, very deli deliberate about that. We also changed the curriculum. We didn't, it's still our curriculum, but we included specific elements very much dependent on the entrepreneurs we're going to support and in the context that we work in. And this is what we do in all the different regions. We do it in a very different way. We'll move the curriculum around, we'll slow down the pace depending on where we are. We also created a female only environment. So the facilitators, the participants, the mentors, the guests were all female. Um, we did have male mentors and male guests, they didn't stay overnight. So they came for the day and they went. Um, we stayed in a facility where sure, the staff were all men, but they never came into the sessions. And that, I, that made a really big difference. Um, and as some of you know, Bangladesh is predominantly Muslim. And so it was a very comfortable environment for all women, regardless of religion, um, when it was a female only environment. The women who um, were Muslim could take off their headscarves if they felt like it in front of all of us, if they chose to. Uh, one woman brought her child with her as well. And we made sure there were regular prayer times and they didn't have to go somewhere to pray to get, to get um, privacy because they felt so comfortable. We also, um, as we've spoken about before, created a very powerful female advisory board. This is hard and I want to highlight this and we've talked to some of you about this. The only reason we could do this is because of the credibility and the reach of our partner organizations. So I want to highlight that as well, that um, we here in Australia had very little input into creating that. And that is something that, um, you know, you do need networks and you do need connections. And if you don't have them, it's still possible. It will take much longer time. Uh, we had targeted recruitment through pipeline partners. We did a lot of headhunting for Why Her Bangladesh, the first one, a lot. Nearly every single applicant came from a headhunting approach, even though that you see at the start, we had targeted marketing. Um, and then, we also had funding allocated specifically for these applicants to make the program very, very attractive. So as you can see, we talk a lot about why her and how successful it is and it is, but there was a lot of work that went to it because the first option failed. And then um, nothing will actually happen as Audrey mentioned until there's an implementation plan. And this is so, so important. I can't stress how important implementation is because, well, we all know this because we work in this space. You can come up with a really great idea. Um, a lot of us in this space will come up with wonderful ideas. You need a team to execute it and you need a plan to execute and implement it. So again, five clear steps, clear gender objective. Our objective was to create an equal platform for female impact entrepreneurs. We then had clear, really clear milestones and measurable indicators. Um, so we set quotas and numbers and some of them, the ones you see here, some of them are quantitative, some of them are qualitative. So our country directors had to make sure that there were at least 50 applicants into the program for WIHO. And of those 50, there had to be at least 15 that were high quality and selected. 
we also had to make sure the advisory board was set up and as part of the recruitment tool probably about six weeks before we started recruiting because they helped us recruit the high quality applicants. We also committed as an organization growth funding to at least two ventures. Um, so they were measurable indicators that we, we backed and we said that this is what it is to make sure that the program was successful. We also had strong support from our board and leadership team. So um, WIHER is a relatively new program for us, but we made sure that every single person on the board was committed to it. And same with our local country partner. Um, not only that, so you, we, had, uh, we had commitment from the leadership team, but we also had commitment from the wider junior team. Because we are a small team, we wanted everyone to understand why we were doing something so different from our core program. Um, and you know, we were still testing the model. So it's really important to have that buy-in because as all of you know, you will use multiple resources within your team to make something like this happen. Uh, and then we, we actually um, did allocate really specific resourcing and time to it. Um, we had a dedicated budget and a team allocated only for Why Her. We made sure we had a team of female facilitators and um, we didn't have them in the country. So myself and Caitlin actually flew in for that because at that point in time, we didn't have strong female facilitators in Bangladesh. We had support facilitators who were, who were women and they came along with us as well. And then we also put in effort to design the specific curriculum. And last but not least is the accountability. So we made sure that the reporting for Why Her was in no way different than we have reporting from any other program. We were just as rigid, just as meticulous. Um, they had the same KPIs and outcomes that you know we determined during the co-design phase. So we want we knew that for it to be successful, it needed to be as high quality as our other programs. So we made sure that was woven in right at the start. Does that make sense? So we've just taken you through the whole thing. You've obviously going to get access to all of this. Um, but I wanted to take you through exactly how we did it. It took, um, and I can tell you even now, we've run six YHERS, um, some country specific, most of them are region. We are still iterating and tweaking and changing how we are doing things um, because that is the nature of what we do. And that is to really make it. So for example, one of the things we're looking at in YHER Pacific, um, and in the Pacific region specifically, is the issues or um, the options around what would happen if someone who is not of a binary gender, who is not male or female, but identifies as a female, do we accept them into our program? You know, so these are really live issues. These are really complex issues that we're continuing to, to look at and applying a gender lens and a power lens to make sure that you know, it is something we can add value to and we're constantly learning. Anything to add, Audrey? No, I think that's, that's it. I think that the last example with the Pacific as well, it shows the power of like the contextualization because with us, it was a no brainer where we want to be super inclusive and anyone that identifies as a woman would be able to come in, but then we have to consider the context and because it is a regional program, what's everyone's perceptions and feelings um, towards non-binary people who identify as women in the region to make sure that we don't compromise on that safe space that we're creating. So again, we do apply that gender lens. And then on top of that, we need to really contextualize it every time that we apply um, a gender lens to any of the regions that we work in. So, And we applied a lens to ourselves as the, the team creating it, right? So as Audrey said, one of the first things is like, oh, in a, from the Australian context, of course, we should take in anyone. That's the best thing to do. We're going to be leaders in the space. And then we went back going, hang on, is this really what the community needs? Is this something that we are able to deliver to them? And the way we did that, um, the key people we relied on were our local country director and Millie. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, Millie, Audrey. Aud Millie is our local country director and Audrey is here who have you know, grown up there and understand the context way more than we do. Um, and that is something that's really, really important as we grow, like it, part of it is the identity of your organization and your program. A lot of it, most of it must come from the context you work in and the best people to inform you are the people on the ground.
Exactly. And I think that goes back to we're taking you through a process that we've taken with an example, but applying a gender lens more broadly to your work does really require you to, as Manita mentioned, you know, even identify in yourself what are your own privileges, bias, and, and the own lens that you apply when you're selecting entrepreneurs of different genders and different contexts. So it's, it's really important to also go that, on that journey um, as an organization, but also um, for yourself as well. Any questions or comments before we jump into the next example? Oh, I'm just going to check the chat very quickly. Um, so we've just got a um, question from Ragini. Have you encountered a situation where you have had to compromise given on the milestones because an investor partner says the growth funding is better suited to another enterprise and, gen and gender should not factor in? Okay, the argument of um, meritocracy. Yeah, um, not at this stage. And that is because uh, we ha we created the program and part of us creating the program is to allocate this funding to them. Um, the other reason is the investors and donors at the moment give us the funding and it is at our discretion uh, and the discretion of our investment subcommittee on who is awarded that funding. We also have a strong criteria that we measure um, each of our entrepreneurs against. But what you've highlighted is actually a really big issue. Um, and it's, we, we talk about this a lot and how do we actually, uh, in this particular program, we have specific funding allocated for um, growth funding, oh, sorry, growth investment funding or philanthropic funding for these, for these, for these ventures. Um, where we are, what we are looking at now uh, is we, should we highlight the fact that there are female entrepreneurs that we're supporting or do we highlight that these are the best entrepreneurs that we're supporting right and we're having this discussion at the moment and um sure some on some investors will look at two entrepreneurs and if one is female one is not um that, that there is that natural bias and we face that all the time it's a really really complex one if you have a good relationship with the donor and investor as the intermediary um, have those conversations and also bring it back and I would say show them the criteria that is used to assess them on and say that actually gender might play an issue but not when it comes to make a decision about whether that venture is viable to secure that investment. Um, I also think there's a lot of research and we'll go through this when we kind of um, talk briefly about the toolkit at the end, but we did all this research and there is a lot out there around the, the benefits and the um, financial sustainability of female adventures as well. And that narrative is still getting built, but um, in the social impact space and the social enterprises, there is a lot of benefits to actually investing in female founders and female adventures. So it is a bit of a narrative and unfortunately there are investors and donors that are never gonna change their bias and how they view the world. But as Manita said, um, some will, and some will just naturally be aligned to what you're trying to achieve and trying to partner with them is, is a, a great strategy to being able to achieve your, your goals and establish this types of program in the very beginning when you don't yet have those outputs and outcomes that you can, you can use to kind of back what, what you're trying to test and, and the impact you're trying to have. And I would almost put three lenses on, right? Like I would look at it in three ways. You can have an investor who completely understands and, and wants to support female entrepreneurship um, and is willing to take the risks, great. If you've got them, hold on to them. There's not much more conversation. The second one is someone you have a really deep relationship with who you can um, help educate about this and together, you guys can learn together. And so you can not only influence how they are investing to your entrepreneurs and, and to you, but also you can help get them to influence other players in the market. Great, have those conversations and be really, really deliberate about it. You will have that third investor, which most of us will know, who is your traditional um, male investor looking at it from a very conventional point of view. Our strong suggestion in that in that case is go with your criteria and go with the go with the metrics that you use and they use to determine success of a venture. Don't try and communicate that; it's too difficult, right? 
Um, and that, that's just from experience. If you can actually demonstrate that this venture is going to be successful and profitable and scalable because of X, Y, and Z, don't play the gender card if you don't have to, right? Um, you can if you want to, but you sometimes we just don't know where they're sitting. And I always think of what is the ultimate outcome we're trying to achieve? If the ultimate outcome is support for this venture, uh, because we believe in them, this donor or investor, you know, we don't know where they stand with the gender issue, don't raise it with them. Let's play for the, for the bigger outcome. As that, as that success grows together, then you can start bringing them into that second category of that trusted donor that you can actually go, hey, guess what? You've now invested in three of our entrepreneurs who are all, all women, and this is the data that's supporting it. Did you know and have those conversations? Um, so just think about where they fit in and you will need to adjust your language and the information you provide based on that. Amazing. Any other questions? Great. Okay, we'll just jump into the second example now, but please feel free to jump in and we can revisit this example as well um, throughout if you, if you want to. The second one, this is a really tasty live example that we're doing right now. Um, this is increasing the gender diversity in, uh, in our board. Um, the way we have written it here is in your leadership team, because you might not have a board, you might have a leadership team or a founding team, committee and executives, who is making the decisions, you know, who, who ultimately makes the decisions. Um, that's the group we're talking about here. So with YGAP, we want to have a board that is gender diverse. And we want this because we want to make sure that all genders are equally represented in the decision making space, right? We also want a board that looks like the people and entrepreneurs we support. Um, we have a female focused program. We have a refugee program. We work in emerging markets. Gender plays a big part in that. So we wanted the board to represent that. Um, we also know and we strongly believe that you know, diversity within our board and within our team will provoke really um, important thoughts and powerful leadership. There's data to support that and we see that, so we want to, we want to get there. Uh, so when you look at our gender objective around our board, we wanted gender diversity and inclusion at all levels of our organization, starting with the board. And again, issue identification. So <laughs> the main issue we were facing very, very simply is there's a lack of gender diversity at the board level. When I started at YGAP about two and a half years ago, um, there were nine board members and only two of them were female directors. This is before I became a director of YGAP. Um, now, right now at this instant, I am the only female board member. Um, and it's a smaller board, it's six. Now, the reason I say that is a decision around changing board leadership or executive level, this will take time. You cannot, un unless, unless um, someone does something illegal or anything, there are terms associated with people's employments, there's terms associated with how someone um, is, how, for how long someone is on the board. There's, in our constitution, we also have a very strong process around if, if one board member comes off, how many can be brought on? Um, if two board members come off, how many can be brought on? How many executive, non-executive? There's lots of levers we need to consider. But the most important thing is that about 12 months ago, when I signed my papers saying, yes, I will become the CEO of YGAP, I made sure that this was at the top of the mind of my chairman and my board and my team. And that's how long we've been working on it. Um, and then there's a broader issues that you can look at and key stats relating to that. And I'll, we'll just leave that there for you to reference. So we were looking at um, a number of aspects that might influence why we were facing these issues. And we looked at you know, who is holding the decision-making power. And it was very clear that 
um, our chairman, a chairperson has always been a male at, on the YGAP board. Um, and how do we actually change that? How do we attract and create gender diverse board, um, but also a board that has people with the right skill sets and the background and the cultural fit to help us take YGAP to where we want to go. It's not a quick fix. And this is one thing that I keep telling everyone when everyone's saying, what's happening, what's happening? I'm like, it's not a quick fix because we actually have a good board. We actually have a very effective board to get us to where we are now. Uh, we now need to add to it. Um, and what are the current processes and why are more female board members being selected? Um, so we asked ourselves this question at the board level, at the team level. Um, and then we talked about, okay, well, how can we increase the number of women coming onto the board? So one of the first things um, our chairman started to do is, is calling out this issue at every single board meeting, every single public event that we're at. And for me, that was really, really important. I didn't ask him to do that, but he acknowledges very deeply that the YGAP board does not have gender diversity and we are working on that and this is how we're doing it. Um, and that gives us a lot of faith that it, this is happening and it also publicly states that this is actually an issue that not, it's not just YGAP facing it, everyone's facing it. We are being very open and talking about it. We also set a timeline to achieve the targets and um, that timeline's about 24 months. And the reason for that is what we were discussing before. There's terms associated with board positions um, and also it takes time to find the right people. We are right now conducting a gap analysis of our board using our board matrix of an example of which you'll be able to see in our, the gender toolkit once it's made public. Um, very recently, um, I'm very, very proud to say this, we included um, as part of the skill set, uh, a key skill is to have gender diversity and inclusion um, as, as a skill within our board members. Not all of them will have that, have that just like not all of us have a legal skill set, but we make sure that someone on the board has that skill set, not only in theory, but in practice. Um, all our uh, position descriptions at the board level and staff level show our commitment to gender diversity and inclusion, and it's stated explicitly in all of them. Um, we're also talking about a quota and the metrics associated with our board and making sure we're not just ticking the box of having 50-50 board members, but that, it, that we actually have the skills and the capacity to deliver on it. And again, we were publicly acknowledging our learnings and the processes and outcomes. Um, and when we achieve this, we will shout it out loud because it is not an easy endeavor, um, but we are, we are working on this continuously. Any questions relating to that one? So once we created the st strategy, it's how we're going to implement it. So again, you can see our objective up top. Um, we are talking about having an equal number of men and women on YGAP's board, noting I'm using um, a binary terminology for gender. We all know that there's non-binary individuals and that's okay. Um, and we also set ourselves a time frame to achieve this. Um, we have strong support from the chairperson, which is really, really important. And we also have commitment from all our current board members. Um, and when you're looking at resourcing, this is an action item that comes on our in our board meetings, every board meeting, um, in all our minutes, and we, and we measure what we're doing against it. Has it been advertised? Who are we speaking to? What is the next steps? We've had people come in, come in as, as observers to see if they're the suitable people to come onto the board. Um, and that's the accountability. We, it's discussed very openly at our board meetings and every, every single board director is accountable to finding suitable board members. We're also going to advertise openly very soon to attract some new ones. Great. Amazing. Um, before we go on to considerations, are there any questions about that last example we just went through? Great. Please feel free to jump in still um, whilst I go through the considerations or put things in the chat if you did want to ask any questions. So we just wanted to put a few considerations. Um, we went through two examples. We went through a process. But what are the considerations when applying the, the process and applying the gender lens to your work? So we keep mentioning this and I think that was really well illustrated through the examples, but context is really important. 
no one size will fit all um, and gender related issues will really depend on the geography, ethnicity, political stability of um, the system and education levels, a lot of different factors. So especially for youth who have um, programs across different locations, context is going to be very, very important. Um, also, the second one is that it's not only about applying strategies and going through a process step by step, but it's about developing a mindset. Um, as you go through the process though, and we've, we've uh, felt this really, you start questioning everything and you start yeah. developing that mindset where you're everything that you do or you try to put in place, um, you will question how is this being experienced by different genders. This kind of comes over time, but it takes a bit of time because um, we do have to acknowledge our own biases, our own privilege and everything that we do and then um, see where we, we kind of fit with applying this gender lens to our work. I'm going to just interrupt you here because it's a real practical example that since we've been working on this just before Audrey said to me, um, I just started using this language because now it just comes automatically to me because this is what we're doing all the time. And Audrey and I do this really, really deeply every single day, but there's other team members who are now talking about it and mentioning it. Um, and I think, and that's the thing, it's like a muscle, like the mindset is like a muscle we're continuing to use, but it does take time and patience and I'll let Audrey continue. Absolutely. And I think that's also when, when we think of everything we've spoken about so far, we're thinking about our own mindset and then we're looking at how we can um, support our organization to have that mindset, everyone at all levels. And then we're thinking about how can we um, um, include this in our program and with our entrepreneurs as they're building their organizations. And then how can we influence our ecosystem? So although we are developing this language um, together because we, we're in it day in and day out, um, it's really important to also take everyone else on the journey. Otherwise, we're just speaking that language to ourselves yeah. and it's not as impactful um, mm -hmm. or effective. The third point is that it will take time and patience. Unfortunately, this is no, there's no magic wand. Um, we actually had a conversation with the Criterion Institute the other day, and they've been doing this for 15 years, all, and all of their research is on this, and they still feel like they have a long way to go. So everyone we've spoken to in our research as well, and we feel like that as well. We're no expert. We're just trying our best, and we're... Um, we're constantly evolving what we're doing, staying curious and just asking questions to make sure that we're constantly doing the best we can to apply a gender lens to everything that we do. The fourth point is, and we've mentioned this a few times, intersectionality. So diversity and inclusion is broader than gender and different factors like ethnicity, age can actually compound the um, effects of, uh, of, different, of different genders and, and what they experience, whether that's disadvantage or benefits. So it's important as much as we talk a lot about gender and power in this thematic, because that's the theme and um, it's complex enough and deep enough that we can, we can have a theme and a whole thematic around it. It's good to think about diversity much broader and also the benefits of diversity much broader. So if we're thinking about gender diversity within our board, um, there's also a lot of benefits to having different cultural diversity within your board as well. So it's just thinking about it beyond gender. And then gender is not binary. Um, in the examples that we've used, um, it's been a lot about female entrepreneurs because they are still an underrepresented group within the ecosystem. But gender is not binary and there's different genders and depending on context, that's more or less accepted yet. But it is something to consider and because you consider how that applies to your specific country, region or context when you're applying a gender lens. So if there's no questions on the consideration, then feel free to jump in again at any time. We just wanted to provide an update on the Gender Lens Incubation Acceleration Toolkit that we brought up in our first webinar. And we've been providing little updates here and there um, throughout the Frontier Incubator's work. So this is a toolkit that has been created for intermediaries. It's the first of its kind. And the idea is that it provide practical tools, strategies, and real world case studies to support um, intermediaries in applying a gender lens to your work. So just how can you consider how all of your activities, whether it's within your organization, your program, or how you interact with your ecosystem is experienced by different gender groups. So it's a lot of what we've been doing in this um, webinar, and we're just building a toolkit around it. Um, this toolkit is at the moment being developed and tested. It's been piloted by a few intermediaries, um, some part of the Frontier Incubators cohort and some outside. Um, we do, it will be available in later this year, but we do have an exciting opportunity if you are 
um, really excited to get your hands on it and want to start applying and, and testing it um, right away. There is an opportunity to access it early. It is in draft form, we won't lie. <laughs> There's a lot of great things in there, but we're still testing what works and we want to get feedback. So if you did want a, the opportunity to access it early and get your hands on it, um, please contact me directly and we'll arrange this. And this is in response to the last seminar, actually, when I think Sean Kalita, you were on, and um, I don't think it was you, Shabra, I think it was Kazi, and we were talking about it. And one of the things that keeps coming up when we are doing these webinars and doing one-on-ones with you guys as well is, um, is there something that we can use to actually do this as a holistic thing? Yes. It's part of another a related program. Um, we now know that we can share this with you, that there's a few steps involved. So if you can um, email Audrey and we can take you through those steps, but it's super exciting. It's, it won't look as pretty as what it will look in December, um, but all the content is there. And if you would like to be early adopters and, um, and try some things out and give us some really honest, constructive feedback, because this is something um, not just for Asia Pacific, it's something that it's a first iteration and we think it's going to be something that will be used quite broadly. We're getting quite a lot of um, asks and publicity around it. So please contact Audrey and we'd love your feedback because you guys have, because all of you have sort of come through the journey with us right from last November until now, you have such a deep understanding of it and plus what you do um, is so related to it, that'll be great great for you guys to access it and have a look if you want to. <laughs> Amazing. So yes, please let us know. Just contact me um, through Slack or through email if you do want to have access to this toolkit. All right, so we're just wrapping up now. Um, looks like we'll be able to have a little bit of an early finish. Um, so the key takeaways from this webinar is that I know we've taken you through a process and we've taken you through examples, but again, it is more than a process to apply a gender lens. It really becomes about developing a mindset and embedding it in everything that you do. Um, some key consideration, again, context is very important and we'll keep repeating that. And even on this call, we have so many different countries and contexts represented. Um, it will take time and effort. <laughs> again, and we would love for it to be an overnight thing, but, um, Although you'll have strategies that are shorter term that you can test more quickly and some that are a little bit more um, effort intensive, it will take time and effort and just acknowledging the fact that the systems and the our contexts are always evolving when it comes to um, issues relating to gender and power. So it's good to always check in and make sure that whatever strategy you are applying still addresses issues that are relevant and that haven't evolved and still um, trying to measure whether there are unintended consequences as the context kind of evolves of the strategies that you have implemented to solve those problems. And then diversity goes beyond gender. Again, the, the focus of this thematic has been very strongly on gender, but we really want to acknowledge that there are so many other factors that um, need to be taken into account more broadly. And next step, so again, we do have one-on-ones and a lot of you have done one-on-ones with us already. If you did want to flesh out strategies specifically to do with your organization, your program, how you influence your ecosystem, or if you just want to have a conversation more broadly around this topic and how it could apply in your context, please do not hesitate to contact me on Slack or by email and we can schedule a one-on-one. -on -one. You have four included as part of your Frontier Incubator um, package or program. And the next um, thing on our calendar, again, this is our last webinar, sadly, but we have our, um, a seminar in about a month's time, which we'll just discuss. We, we haven't quite fleshed out what the format's going to be yet, but it's going to be really rich discussion. It's not um, uh, recorded, so it really allows the group to share ideas and, and ask the hard questions and, and kind of work together to find solutions or at least develop some strategies that could be helpful to be tested. So that's us for our fourth and final webinar. Does anyone have any final questions? Thoughts, concerns? No, okay, no worries. Well, you know where to find us anyways. You can find us through Slack or by email and we're looking forward to seeing you in our next seminar. Again, if any one of you want one-on-one -on -one time, please feel free to contact us, otherwise, 
Thank you for joining today. Um, we hope it's been very helpful. We know we've found so much value in putting this webinars together. Um, and, and yes, looking yeah. forward to hearing about how you're applying a gender lens to your work. And for me as well, thank you so much, um, especially the few of you who've pretty much come to every single one and acknowledge that, you know, um, yeah, I know you said you weren't able to, and that's absolutely okay. Um, but it's it's been fantastic. Again, no one has done this before, so we're part of the first group of people who are doing this, all of us here together. So just wanted to honor that and acknowledge that, that you know, we're actually going to make big things happen, even though it might not feel like it at the moment. So thank you for being part of it. It's really, really exciting. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye.